Today we're reviewing AMD's Ryzen 5 3600X, the $50 more expensive counterpart to the R5 3600 that we already gave a high review. The 3600X, like the previous 2600X or 1600X counterparts and the previous generations, is functionally just a higher clocked 3600 out of the box without the need to do anything to reach those clocks. And that's about all it is. There's no difference in core count, there's no difference in cache, there's no difference in anything except for the frequencies out of the box, and it's an extra 50 bucks. So what we're looking at today is, is it worth actually paying 25% more for the amount of performance you gain? We'll be looking at a more limited set of benchmarks for this one because it's pretty straightforward. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair's Hydro X water cooling series. Corsair Strength is bringing water cooling to the masses, and it has built out cooling solutions with industry leaders to help newcomers get into open loop cooling. Corsair has fittings, adapters, GPU water blocks, CPU water blocks, pump res combos, and radiators all available in the Hydrax line. As you can see in our footage, these kits can be used to build beautiful open loop systems. Learn more at the link in the description below. So if we're going over the benchmark charts in a bit, we won't be rehashing the same thing we did in the 3600 review. We're not going to be comparing the 3600X versus all the competing Intel parts, all the old gen AMD parts. The numbers will be on the chart, but I'm not gonna read through it. If you wanna see that comparison, check the 3600 review, it's the same thing. For this one, all we're doing is looking at the 3600X versus the 3600 and if it's worth it. That's really all we care about for this one. Uh, separately, we're not going to show every single game and every single production workload because the story is more or less told within just a couple of the charts. So no need to go through 30 minutes of the same numbers. And overclocking, we were able to get the 3600X to the same frequency as every other Ryzen chip we've worked with so far, which is 4.3 gigahertz all core. We could not overclock it manually past that point. And as far as the question of PBO, that's in a separate video of ours. If it's not up already, it will be shortly. So uh, yeah, 4.3 gigahertz. If you're at 4.3 all core on the 3600X, it's gonna be the same as 4.3 all core on the 3600. Just like the 1700X, the same clocks as an overclocked 1700 would give you the same results. So uh, those numbers will not be in the chart because you can just look at the 3600 at 4.3 and that's what it is. Higher performance is seen largely in the scenarios where it is seen because of the higher single core frequency. So that's the biggest deal here. So when you do see a higher performance, it's typically because the boosting frequency uh, with a single or single core dual thread scenario is going to be higher with the X skew than with the non X skew. It's just a question of, again, does it matter? Is it worth it? So let's get into the numbers. This will be a pretty easy one today. We'll go through games, a couple of them, a couple of production workloads, and then power. Assassin's Creed Origins is an interesting demonstration as it shows performance scaling with both frequency and cores. For the R5-3600X, the result ends up being 118 FPS average, which pushes beyond the 4.3 GHz all-core 3600OC of 116 FPS average. And this, we think, is because of the dual-thread boost of the 3600X being 4.4 GHz, whereas the 3600OC was locked to 4.3 GHz all-core and will never hit 4.4. That extra 100 megahertz on two threads helps in some scenarios, like this one. Scaling versus the 3600 stock result is 3.1% higher. We clocked the 3600X to 4.3 gigahertz all core, but it's literally the same as the R5 3600 once you overclock them to the same settings. So there's no point in going through all the retesting again. The 1440p result shows the same thing. The 3600X scales better with its limited thread boosting than the 3600OC, unsurprisingly, and so we can move on to the next game. F1 2018 is next and likes frequency and IPC. For this one, the R5-3600X stock CPU ends up at 1% ahead of the 3600 CPU. The 3600 at 4.3 gigahertz lands at 271 FPS average or 0.5% ahead of the 3600X stock with an error, predictably. 1440p has all tests within error margins of one another. We are not able to determine a difference of this test and they are all functionally equal. Civilization VI provides a look at turn time processing on average in seconds rather than FPS. The R5-3600X completes the average turn in 35 seconds, with the 3600 completing the average turn in 36 seconds. Civilization is more frequency dependent than other games, again clearly illustrated by the 9900K 5.1 GHz result exactly matching the 9700K 5.1 result. And so the 3600X benefits from a 2.8% time requirement reduction in exchange for the 25% higher cost. The all-core OC is close, but not quite there. 
GTA 5 has the 3600X at 106.8 FPS average, or tied with the 4.3 GHz all-core OC, 3600 results of 106 FPS average. We normally round to the nearest whole number for these, but when the difference is what it is here, it might as well read it out. The R5 3600 stock CPU finishes with a 104.3 FPS average. Again, there's no real benefit here, although differences are measurable. They are indistinguishable to the end user. They are not perceptible, although, but you can measure them with software. So this couldn't be nearly gotten with an all-core OC once again, and even that is not particularly worth it. 1440p results are the same, again, with barely any difference between the 3600 SKU CPUs. We are at 103.5 FPS average at the low end and 106.2 FPS average at the high end, ignoring the 3600 SMT off uh, result of 108.2 FPS average. The 3600 to 3600X gain is 2.6% in exchange for 25% more money. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is among our last two games. The 3600X ends up at 140 FPS average, which places it as tied with the 3600 all-core OC of 139 FPS average, and imperceptibly ahead of the R5 3600 stock CPU, gaining just 1.7%. Hitman 2 with DX12 tested the 3600X at 117 FPS average, those within reasonable run-to-run -run variants of the others. This result positions the R5 3600 as 1.7% ahead of the 3600 stock CPU, not particularly impressive, and tied with the R5 3600 4.3 GHz all-core OC. 1440p keeps the scaling and positioning just with everything slightly lower. The R5 3600X ends up at 115.6 FPS average, with the 3600 at 114 FPS average. The overclock is functionally tied with the 3600X once again. Moving on to a couple of the production tests, because frankly it's, it's really not worth showing all of them at all. We'll just show three here. A 7-zip is next. For this one, we test compression and decompression. These results, like almost all the others, are an average of averages, so we're looking at a lot of data points for each benchmark. Uh, and we're averaging the averages, which gives us a pretty accurate number. The test is measured in millions of instructions per second, which we'll abbreviate as MIPS. The R5 3600X lands at 56,595 MIPS for compression, which expectedly ties it with the 3600 overclock and has the two within error of one another. Versus the stock 3600, the improvement is the same as the 4.3 GHz all-core 3600. It's 2.5% uplift as the maximum we gain meaning that $50 gets you 2.5% over baseline, making this a hard argument over AMD's cheaper option, even ignoring the overclocking. Decompression is next. For this chart, the 3600X ends up at 72,000 MIPS, allowing the 4.3 GHz all-core 3600 a lead of 74,600 MIPS, or a 3.4% increase in performance thanks to the fixed all-core frequency. Versus the R5 3600 CPU, the 3600X sees an increase of just 3%. Adobe Photoshop is next. As we mentioned in the 3600 review, this is a heavily frequency-bound workload, which means that the Ryzen CPUs in general fall below Intel's. For our comparison today, the 3600X ends up at 966 points, where higher is better as a calculation of transform, warp, filter, and other effects. The R5 3600 stock CPU ends up at 957 points. The improvement over stock is 0.9%, with the 3600 at 4.3 gigahertz, allowing an additional jaunt of 1.3% over the 3600X. In this scenario, just going with the 3600 makes the most sense. V-Ray is a renderer made by Chaos Group. A lot of the workstation users in our audience have asked us to benchmark this one lately, so here's what we came up with for CPU performance. The 3600X finishes the render on the CPU in 1.43 minutes, which is 0.02 minutes, or 1.2 seconds, ahead of the R5 3600 stock CPU. The delta is hardly even measurable. It's actually, it's, it's right on the edge of where the, uh, our data accuracy cuts off the decimal points stop after the hundredths for this test. So measurable, certainly not perceptible, and measurable only with a lot of test passes. So no difference once again. Power consumption as measured at the 12 volt rails is up next. In Blender, this has the R5 3600X at roughly 80 watts, about equal with the R5 3600 in the same workload. The overclock to 4.3 gigahertz on the 3600 pushes it to 90 watts, which is because we've had to increase the voltage significantly to hold stability in this test. As a reminder, we test the Intel CPU properly by disabling MCE and allowing turbo boost limits to exist as spec defines, 
and exiting spec would allow higher power consumption, obviously. So you would see higher numbers here if you enabled MCE on, say, an ASUS board. There's no meaningful change in power consumed in this test for the 3600 versus the 3600X when both are stock. For gaming power consumption, the R5 3600X ends up consuming about the same power as the 3600, landing at 55 watts for this workload. Overclocking doesn't blow out the consumption here as we're ultimately limited by what the application demands, which is comparatively little when looking at Blender previously. Overall then, there's a 25% increase in price between the 3600 and the 3600X, and the performance increases don't even come close to matching that. CPUs at the high end of the line can get away with price bumps like that because customers spending $400 plus on a CPU want to have the biggest numbers, the most cores, the highest frequency, no matter what. The 3600X is towards the less expensive end of the Ryzen 3000 stack, so it has to justify every dollar it costs over the next CPU down, or in this case, the next CPU up as well. And again, as a reminder, like we said in the 3600 review, some of AMD's biggest competition this generation is its previous half-step generation. 2000 series processors are on pretty sharp sales right now. The 2600X, we've seen around $160, give or take, which is a really good deal for a processor that we were pretty happy with. The 2600 is even cheaper. If you want to follow the same advice as in this review, you could even step down to a 2600, around $140 these days, overclock it to 4.0 or 4.1, and you'd effectively have a 2600X. That said, obviously there's a performance increase with a 3000 series, so it just kind of depends on how much money you're willing to spend and where you need to pinch pennies, and that's entirely up to your situation. But for the 3600X, we come to the same conclusion we've come to often in the past, which is you're really only buying this thing if, actually it's even harder to justify than the previous ones. With the previous generations, like the 1600, we could say, look, there's a pretty big jump in performance if you overclock it. It's easy to overclock. Just throw an all-core OC on there, 3.9 gigahertz, maybe four, and you have a really damn good processor that can beat the stock 1600X. But that was a different time. Now, with overclocking where it is, with Ryzen 3000 more or less being pushed to the max, even that angle is difficult where you're within a couple percentage points, like three max on average, anyway, between the 3600 to the 3600X, both stock. So a 3% performance gain, sort of at the best, is just not really worth it and uh, not worth $50. So for almost everyone, we would say 3600 over the 3600X. If you really want the 3600X, it's probably because you care enough about that couple percent that you're willing to pay $50 for it to get a higher single core boost frequency because that's what you're getting with it in terms of out of the box spec. In terms of overclocking, if your intent is to buy a Ryzen CPU, throw an all core OC on there and never touch it again, it doesn't matter what you buy. Uh, technically, the 3600 and the 3600X overclocked to the same value will produce the same numbers, but we don't know if the 3600X might be binned a little bit better. So maybe there's some silicon lottery gambling in there if you buy the 3600 instead of the 3600X. We're not sure, we don't have a sample size of hundreds to check, but that would be the only real consideration is silicon binning for overclocking quality. And with these chips, when you're fighting between 4.2 and 4.3, it sort of stops mattering, especially since the stock 3600X can outperform an all-core OC at 4.3 in cases where single, th single uh, core dual thread scenarios would matter. So that'll be the review. Short version, not worth it. We still really like the R5 3600 and think that's a fantastic processor at the price. Intel's got some competition towards the higher end of the stack. The 9600K is not really in, in our consideration for the most part at this level. Uh, I won't go over all the reasons why again in this one. If you want to see it, just watch the R5 3600 review or if you're lazy, you could skip to the end of it. We typically don't recommend that, though, because you'll miss all the context. Uh, and then for AMD competition versus itself, the 2000 series, like the 2700, 2700X, those are going to be similarly priced these days. So if you need the extra cores and you can sacrifice some of the frequency, that might be a consideration as well. So thank you for watching. That's it for this one. Subscribe for more. You go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly by buying something like a toolkit or a mod mat, or you go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. I'll see you all next time.